Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith and uh, it's very noisy where I am so I will have to uh, shout a little bit but where I am is um, I'm just north of uh, Lake Superior along the uh, Highway 17 route heading back to Ottawa. Still about a 16 hour drive to get there and uh, what we have here is the Aguasabon um, River with a waterfall and uh, just a little bit further along from here is a huge uh, hydroelectric uh, generating station. They've created a reservoir with the dam and they've uh, bored over a kilometer straight through the rock underneath the, uh, the highway um, to divert the water through the uh, power stations. This project was built um, 1945 to 1948, and I think it generates about 34 megawatts of uh, power, but you can check it out yourself. It's really kind of neat. It's the Ag Aguasabon, A-G-U-A-S-A-B-O-N, I believe. Um, and, uh, but what I really want to talk about here is just some sort of, well, first of all, I'll show you uh, the, the area here a bit. You can see uh, in the distance, actually it's now clouded out, but in the distance is, uh, you know, just um, up here and up uh, in the background there is uh, Lake Superior. And it started to rain here and the visibility has gone way down. But what I really want to talk about here is just some big picture things. People ask me all the time for my predictions. You know, when will sea ice be gone? When will we have global food shortages? Uh, you know, what's going to happen moving forward? When will the world take action? You know, when will we come up with technologies to suck huge amounts of CO2 out, out of the atmosphere? And when will we deploy solar radiation management technologies? Because I think all of these things are going to happen and probably sooner than you think. So, um, so I'll just give my kind of overview here. So. I fully expect the complete loss of Arctic sea ice and the so-called blue ocean event um, within the next um, five years. You know, maybe in two or three years, but it's a fool's game to predict an exact year. But the trends are all down. And I think one year, you know, what's going to happen is uh, the winter uh, freeze just won't really occur significantly one year. And then uh, within a summer or two of that uh, lack of freeze, you know, no ice substance, you know, slushy up there will completely lose the Arctic sea ice. Um, by uh, mid-September, one year, I'd say within the next five years. And uh, when that happens, there'll be no sea ice, uh, the, the so-called, I call it the, I coined the phrase, the, Ar the Arctic blue ocean event will occur and uh, subsequent refreezing will be very, very uh, severely reduced. So within, uh, within a few years, of, so, so let's say, you know, for the sake of argument, 2025 for uh, the first blue ocean event, maybe it'll be 2023 or 2022, who knows, maybe it'll be a bit later. But uh, basically, after that occurs, what I fully anticipate is within a couple years of that first blue ocean event, say within three years, there would be no sea ice um, for a, a month bracketing September. So the first blue ocean event might be a couple weeks to a month of September. Um, and then uh, within say three years of that, no sea ice in August, September, October, Within five or six years of the first blue ocean event, no sea ice in July, August, September, October, and November. And I would say within about a decade of the first blue ocean event, I've, I wouldn't expect there to be any sea ice uh, year, year round in the Arctic. So we'll be in a much different world. The atmosphere and ocean um, circulation patterns that carry enormous amounts of heat from the equator to the poles our, 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 uh, will be rewired if you like and uh, what this will lead to the biggest consequence to humanity I believe will be uh, a global famine global food shortages uh, 
you know, say within that time period, that 10 year time period, within about a decade. So these are things that uh, we need to be prepared for as countries and as individuals, uh, because I think these things are pretty much unavoidable at this stage of time. And uh, of course, with a completely, with a much warmer Arctic, we have to be very concerned about the um, release of uh, methane um, from methane clathrates up in the Arctic, and these are in the uh, sediments under the seafloor on the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf, and also in the uh, land-based uh, permafrost, which is thawing very, very rapidly. So huge emissions of CO2 and methane uh, will occur. We're already setting all kinds of uh, records in terms of the um, uh, levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we just surpassed uh, 320 parts per million for CO2, and we've also uh, hit record levels of methane. So methane is uh, over 2,000 parts per billion um, in various regions of the Arctic at various uh, elevations in the atmosphere, and uh, it's continuing to rapidly rise. And uh, we really have to be concerned about losing the carbon sink. So uh, within about a dec within a few decades, with business as usual, and this doesn't even take into account what's going on in the Arctic, we can expect that we uh, that the terrestrial vegetation cover stops uh, absorbing huge amounts of CO2. So so it loses its ability to be a sink and it becomes a net source because as temperature rises, the, the photosyn photosynthesis decreases in a nonlinear fashion. Once you pass the peak of the photosynthesis curve, depending on whether you're C3 or C4 plants, C3 is at 18 Celsius, the peak of the photosynthesis curve, and C4 is at uh, 28 degrees, I believe. So as you pass those uh, limits, the terrestrial vegetation becomes a net carbon uh, source as opposed to a sink, and CO2 levels in the atmosphere will skyrocket. So instead of seeing two or three uh, parts per million rise per year in uh, CO2 levels, we'll probably see double that. We might be seeing uh, four, five, or six uh, parts per million rise in uh, CO2 levels. So. It's going to be very difficult to get high yields of, of crop growth and we're going to have global famine and uh, global food shortages, I would say, within, within the decade. Um, and then uh, this, of course, is going to cause huge uh, geopolitical uh, conflict and turmoil and lots of wars. I mean, we're heading to, uh, you know, we'll be heading to resource wars where people have a lack of uh, fresh water and a lack of food. And this will cause uh, regional conflicts and, uh, you know, around the uh, planet. So we need, we're in a dire uh, climate change emergency and uh, we need to act and respond as if it is a global dire and dire climate change emergency. And the world has failed, very miserably failed to deal adequately with the uh, COVID uh, virus. So you know, where a year, over a year has gone by, we have developed a number of different vaccines. So science has, uh, you know, excelled in developing uh, vaccines, but the new variants, uh, you know, are there and it's a race against time. Now, I'm uh, driving, uh, as you know, I'm, I drove my, uh, if you watch the last few videos, the last video, I dropped off my son uh, in the far north near Kenora for tree planting with his friend and I'm making my way back to Ottawa and uh, getting soaked but uh, you know it's very refreshing it'll keep me awake for the next uh, stint of the drive where I'm, I'm heading to the Sioux, Sioux St. Marie and uh, Sudbury. I'll probably film videos from from those regions uh, especially Sudbury's uh, interesting history as to how the nickel got there uh, from a bolide impact, a meteor impact, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago or millions, of, I don't know exactly when, but it was a nickel bearing meteorite and that's why the nickel is embedded so deeply. So uh, what else will happen? Um, well, I mean, you know that melt rates are skyrocketing around the world. So 
global sea level rise will rapidly accelerate above and beyond anything that we have seen um, as we uh, have this blue ocean event because Greenland will be exposed. It sticks out like a sore thumb. It'll, only, it, it'll be the only center of cold in the Arctic. So not only do the jet streams slow down and become wavier and become stuck in these blocking patterns, but the actual center of rotation of the jet streams, I'm pretty convinced will shift down to be centered around the, about the center of cold and the center of cold, the center of Greenland is at 73 degrees north. So that's offset, um, that's offset 17 degrees from the North Pole. So right now the center of cold, you know, it's not right at the North Pole, it's offset towards Greenland a bit, but now it'll become more like 73 degrees. So the jet streams will, center of rotation will switch to be centered over Greenland. So they'll be coming much lower and lower into uh, North America, if you just look at the look at the map and uh, that will cause very extreme weather in, in North America um, and of course the jet stream slowing and becoming wavier and stuck is causing a huge ramping up of extreme weather events um, I keep shifting my camera to my other hand because my left hand for some reason is starting to get tired after about 15 minutes of holding it holding the camera um, so yeah, the extreme weather events around the world have increased in frequency, severity, and duration, and they're happening in places where they never happened before. And all of this bodes ill for the global food supply and will further accelerate our transition to a global famine. So it's very important that uh, countries that that, that governments, you know, more and more governments have declared a global climate emergency and then they've done nothing at all. So it's still, with, it's still words, it's empty words. And uh, a few videos ago I talked about the utter futility of the effort from universities to address climate change. You know, the siloed scientists in their labs competing for funding and not giving a rat's ass about the uh, overall planet and, and where it's heading. I mean, it's, it's just pathetic. If you think universities are gonna save us from climate change with research and concern, um, you've got another uh, thing uh, coming because that's just clearly not happening. And there was a very good quote in a, in a paper in a couple videos ago where it said basically that Extinction Rebellion, it's a UK article, it said that Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg alone have done more in a year to raise awareness of abrupt climate change than uh, 60 years of, of, uh, of, of uh, th than in the last 60 years from, from universities. And that counts for governments too, and any other uh, bureaucratic in institutions in our society that are supposed to be there for our good. And instead of that, they're, uh, they're all operating on the mighty dollar, right? Gula, ka-ching, ka-ching, right? And meanwhile, the planet is uh, going to hell. The earth is losing its ability to support, um, support uh, life, especially complex life, like, like humans, okay? The fungi, the bacteria, those things will still be around for eons, but higher life forms, uh, not so, uh, not so clear. So Elon Musk had better hurry up with his idea of uh, hedging humanity, humanity's survival by uh, becoming, making Canada a multi-planetary uh, species. And you know, that's the whole effort of him. And the reason I'm talking about him is because I, as I mentioned in the last video, I listened to some great interviews uh, between him and Joe Rogan, you know, they were drinking whiskey and uh, smoking pot in some of these interviews and just going on and on. And, you know, Rogan has a lot of good, good questions, had a lot of good questions for him. Um, and one of the interviews is actually over three hours, lots of neat stuff in there. So, you know, as I've mentioned before, we need to do a three-legged bar stool approach to try to stave off the worst of abrupt climate change. We need to pull fossil fuels out of the atmosphere. We need to deploy carbon dioxide removal technologies to draw down CO2 levels to 300 odd parts per million. 
and we need to deploy solar radiation management to cool the planet, giving us a chance to do the other two things. Thanks again for listening. Bye for now.